Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And thank you everyone for joining. So today we've got the um, Ebro ECC edition, Global Neuroscience Horizon webinar. And the title or the focus is on the latest advancement in understanding Alzheimer's disease. My name is Dr. Lin Kui Ong. I'm from University of Southern Queensland. Together with me, we've got um, uh, I've got a co-host, uh, Dr. Manuela Caster, and um, she is from Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil. Um, along with us, unfortunately, he can't be here today, um, who also actively and participate in um, organizing this um, webinar is uh, Dr. Jackie Yip, and he is from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. First and foremost, um, given the global aging population, Alzheimer's disease will become a significant global health issue. Therefore, this webinar will bring together emerging early career neuroscientists to discuss the latest advancement in understanding and detecting the disease. This webinar is being organized by the Ebro Early Career Committee. So just a quick introduction to the Ebro Early Career Committee. It's composed of scientists in the early stage of the career and the mission of the Ebro ECC is to support networking and scientific exchange between the individual ECC members and their scientific networks to provide visibility for Ebro among similar career stage scientists through coordinated activities and event of the Ebro ECC, and also to ensure outreach, engagement, and inclusions of ideas and views by the group on behalf of the constituency in the Ebro decision making and program. The Ebro ECC cover five continents and it includes 15 countries or 15 independent principal investigators from 15 countries. So here you can see the list of the name of the um, Ebro ECC members. And just a quick plug, there's a call for paper at Ebro Neuroscience Report hosted by the Ebro ECC. So there are two volumes to spotlight on scientific advances by early career neuroscientists. Volume one will be focused on molecular and cellular neuroscience, and volume two will focus on systems and computational neuroscience. So there's a QR code just at the slides, feel free to scan, or um, there's also a link and um, the team will also um, share the links uh, via the chat function. Without further delay, I would like to then now introduce our very first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Ha Ting Hang Huang. She is the chair of the Department of Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine and also a lecturer at the International University, Vietnam National University in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. So today she will be sharing um, a topic on plasma-free cell, sorry, plasma cell-free RNA profiling of Vietnamese Alzheimer patients reveals a uh, linkage with chronic inflammation and apoptosis a pilot study, and it should be also um, noted that um, this study has been supported by the um, Ebro as well. So um, I would like to stop sharing the screen and um, uh, invite Dr. Ha Thi Han Huang to um, uh, have the floor. Thank you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Lynn, for the kind introductions. And uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or evening, <laughs> where, wherever you are. So it's really a great honor for me to um, be presenting today. And uh, today I will share a pilot study that uh, it is a collaboration between uh, my research group and also the University of uh, Medicine and Pharmacy in Virginia City. And, uh, it is called Plasma Cell Free RNA uh, Profiling of Vietnamese Alzheimer Patient, a pilot study. And uh, the study is funded by the Early Career Award from April and also the Vietnam Alzheimer Network. So, our lab uh, is Grand Health Lab, and we are based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, at the International University. And uh, we have several research orientations. One of them is about developing diagnosis and intervention for Alzheimer's disease. And in this uh, focus, what we do is that we will um, try to investigate different strategy um, in order to develop um, both diagnosis and also intervention method. And so we, we can either use, um, like in the study, uh, blood-based biomarker. We also have several other projects that actually focus on uh, using MRI image and applying in, uh, intelligent, uh, artificial, artificial intelligent analysis. We are also conducting uh, several intervention study, uh, collaborating with uh, another hospital in Ho Chi Minh City. So today we will uh, um, talk about the challenge of um, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So um, as you probably already know, Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease that affecting elderly and um, when the disease occur, uh, what happens is that the brain cell will die off uh, gradually. And most of the time, uh, if the cognitive deficits already manifest, um, the medication that are currently being prescribed will not be very effective in order to slow down the disease progress. Therefore, uh, it's very important that we can spot the disease early in order to apply early intervention uh, either cognitive training or uh, recently we also have a new early FDA approved medication that can be used for people in early stage of Alzheimer's disease. So how can we spot Alzheimer's disease early? Um, previous study already developed very successful approach. For example, we can use best scan that combine with labeling up the molecule that has signature of Alzheimer's disease, for example, uh, amyloid beta accumulation in several friend regions or tau accumulation, those are the signature that can be used in best scanning. And it has been shown to be able to detect Alzheimer quite early, like 10 or even um, earlier, uh, 10 years before the disease, the cognitive deficit benefit. But the problem with best scanning is that it's quite costly. And currently in uh, country, low middle income country like Vietnam, um, we cannot really um, apply this method in clinical setting. Another approach that also has been uh, approved by FDA is CSF, uh, testing using biochemical or molecular approach. Um, but the problem with CSF sampling is that um, most of the time, the patient with Alzheimer will have quite a, a bit of trouble cooperating during the process of taking this kind of sample and they end up have to be anesthetized in order to get a sample. So the um, uh, it's, it's rather invasive and also not applicable. So what we need um, for the early detection of Alzheimer's disease in the context of country like Vietnam is some strategy that is more accessible and also obviously it still provide an accurate um, prediction of Alzheimer's disease. So what our group uh, focus on is to use a uh, blood sample as a source of information in order to understand more about Alzheimer's disease. And so in blood, um, it, there's a process of um, molecule exchange between the cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid and the and blood. Therefore, the uh, change at the cellular and molecular level in the brain can be seen when we analyze blood sample. And one of those molecules that have been investigated in recent year is what we call the cell-free RNA. So these are the RNA that are contained in vesicle, and they are not inside any cell type. They are just uh, flowing freely in the plasma sample. And uh, several studies from uh, 
uh, the US and also uh, from China have shown that um, these molecules are differentially expressed in asthma patients. And the key advantages, if we focus on this type of biomarker is that they is very minimally invasive. And, and also because it's a RNA molecule, uh, we can you approach such as uh, quantitative BCR or some other um, strategy like microarray in order to develop diagnostic platform. So that's our eventual goal is to um, create a blood test for asthma that is affordable and also more accessible for low middle income country. So in this study, we have two primary objectives. The first one is to identify which genes are the key driver of expression changes between two groups, asthma patient and also the um, normally uh, healthy cognitive patient. Um, and uh, these are the genes that probably will have uh, high contribution to the development and progression of asthma disease. The second objective is to examine whether the cell-free RNA transcript significantly correlate with clinical measure of asthma disease severity. So in this study, uh, besides collecting blood sample, we also have the quantity score, and we also have um, an index about the uh, brain structural atrophy. So this, the process of sample collection, uh, it describes this diagram. And all the patients uh, are from the University Medical Center in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, and they are over 55 years old. We have a healthy cohort that have the uh, MMSA score, uh, which is a cognitive measure. Uh, all of them had a score above 27, indicating their normal cognitive status. And we also have an asthma disease cohort that is diagnosed according to the DSM-5 uh, criteria. And after that, we will... Um, uh, collecting the medical record in which there is an MTA index uh, to indicate the level of brain atrophy and then the um, quantities for MMSD. After that, they will be sent for blood collection. And once we get the blood, we will separate the plasma from uh, platelet and white blood cells. And the plasma sample will be sent for RNA sequencing of the cell-free RNA. And here we only focus on one type of cell-free RNA, which is cell-free mRNA. And the reason why we do that is because we think that um, um, it will be easier later to develop assay for diagnosis when we use mRNA instead of um, um, some other type of RNA uh, in the cell-free sample. Uh, besides doing this RNA sequencing and analysis, we also do uh, genotyping uh, of ABOE allele in order to see uh, what is the genetic background of these people? For analysis, uh, we have two uh, main analysis orientation. First one is to focusing on the transcript that are differentially expressed be between the asthma cohort and the healthy cohort, and to see which genes are upregulated and which one is downregulated. And then we will um, identify among those that are up or downregulated, which one of them have correlation with um, the uh, MTA uh, or the MMSA score. And we also look at correlation uh, with the expression um, of ABOE uh, E4 allele. The second uh, direction of analysis is uh, to see among all the transcripts that we discover in the plasma sample of this patient, uh, how are they interacting or connected with each other um, to form these uh, cluster of uh, gene expression and whether this gene expression cluster have any meaningful correlation with the Alzheimer disease status. And when we combine those analysis direction, we'll be able to identify um, what are the key driver uh, or the key biomarker that we can use for uh, future uh, development of diagnostic platform. Um, so that is a summary of the demographic information uh, of our cohort. Um, so we have a very small amount of grant, and that's why we only have 10 patients in each cohort. Um, and the age uh, average is quite similar between two groups. Uh, in the control group, uh, most, uh, and also ID group, the gender distribution are also 
um, there's no significant difference. MMS is for obviously the control group have um, higher score, whereas in the Asthma disease group, we have a wide range of MMS score from very severe to moderately severe to moderate asthma disease. And some of them, we actually uh, did not have the record of the um, MMS score. Um, for the genotyping, we identify here that um, the AD group uh, have high level, higher level of E4 allele expressions, whereas the control group have higher level of E3 uh, allele expression. And this is quite uh, predictable. Um, it's very similar to what we uh, expected because the E4 um, allele tend to contribute to higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when we look at uh, all the transcript between these two cohorts of Alzheimer's disease patient and the control patient, what we found is that there are 136 differentially expressed genes, among them 84 upregulated and 52 deregulated. So when uh, you look at the uh, heat map on the left side of the slide over here, uh, so from left to right are uh, um, control patient and then Alzheimer's patient, uh, annotated with uh, red and green color. And the color of the cell below uh, each of the, the row here is, is corresponding to the expression level of one transcript. Um, the one that have um, hotter color like yellow or red or orange are those that are upregulated uh, in, which means they have higher expression level um, whereas the blue color indicated they have lower expression level. So we have a cluster of gene uh, on the top left here that are highly expressed in control cohorts, but now regulated in Alzheimer patient. And down here we have um, a list of genes that are upregulated um, in Alzheimer patient. When we correlated uh, the expression level of those up and down regulated genes that we identified, we found that 37 of them uh, were correlated to the present of E4 allele. And uh, this plot show those that have significant co correlation. And one of the hypotheses that we have discussed with some other um, collaborators is that perhaps these genes have uh, uh, in the same uh, signaling pathway with E4 allele, or they could also be um, adjacent to E4 on the chromosomes. Uh, about the function of the differentially expressed gene, we found out that they are quite important uh, for several brain processes, and also they could be expressed in different uh, neuronal compartments like dendrite, um, cell body, synapse, postsynaptic density, neural death, uh, and they are uh, important for neural death or synaptic vesicle. Some of them are more involved in um, general processes like apoptosis, uh, chronic inflammatory, uh, stress granule assembly. And this is also in agreement with previous studies show that inflammation might play a role in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer disease. And once we already uh, did analysis on um, the single gene, what we did next is to see how they are expressing together. What are the relationship or connection between those two genes? So we did co-expression analysis and we identify seven gene uh, co-expression model, um, which is shown on the um, right side of the slide here, but only, only three cluster, uh, three, three model among these seven model actually have um, statistical significant correlation with the status of Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, uh, most of them um, do not have correlation with age or sex. So that's mean these genes are actually um, functional. Uh, these expression models are actually fun functional and related to Alzheimer's disease status instead of a randomly um, cluster. So we have the turquoise model here, uh, the yellow model, and also the brown models. Uh, that have significant correlation. Um, the top number is the uh, R values of the co-expression analysis, and the number in the parentheses is the P value. So what, does, uh, what are the functions of these models? So when we did uh, an 
gene annotation analysis, we found out that the brown model are mostly is mostly involved in process that are related to uh, the cell nucleus. For example, um, some of them are um, the, the protein on the nuclear envelope. Some of them are important for transportation of genetic material in and out of nucleus or protein localization to the nucleus. Um, the yellow model is more important for cell adhesion and cell substrate junctions, uh, whereas the turquoise model uh, involved in process that happen in the cytoplasmic, like cytoplasmic translation, uh, RNA metabolic process, and so on. Uh, the next uh, analysis is that we've done is looking at um, uh, in each of those models, when uh, we want to see um, which genes are the key driver. Uh, so what we did is that um, we will analyze the model membership of the genes candidate in this model. And we also will look at um, which of those genes have higher significant correlation with Alzheimer's disease status. So the gene that is in the top, the top right of each of these plots are the one that have higher membership, which means they have more connection with uh, the rest of the genes in the model. And they also have higher level of uh, significant correlation with the Alzheimer disease status. And what was quite interesting is that all the genes in the uh, brown and yellow model are mostly having um, um, upregulated. Uh, they are upregulated genes, whereas the red one over here in the turquoise model are downregulated genes that are related to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, one other uh, Analysis that we perform is that we want to see, um, although these genes are, are already shown to be differentially expressed between Alzheimer and control patient, whether they have any clinically meaningful values. So what we did is that we did correlational analysis between those genes expression level and two different clinical uh, indices. The first one is MTA, which indicate the atrophy level. So what we uh, how MTA measure is that you will look at the gap between the hippocampus and the adjacent region uh, on the MRI scan of the patient. And this is done by the radiologist. So they will look at the MRI uh, data, annotate um, the region that have the hippocampus and then um, measure the MTA score. And so among all, all the genes that are differentially expressed, we found several of them actually have very strong correlation with MTA score. Uh, for example, Foxos1, uh, Tau K3, and Green um, Euro3, uh, SIGB. So many, many of these have positive correlation with MTA score. And several other uh, have the reverse or negative correlation with MMSA score, which is a quality index. Um, so all the results that I've shown you in the previous slide I already published on the frontier of molecular neuroscience. Uh, recently, uh, we did a few more uh, analysis. And so instead of looking the interaction between the cell transcript levels, what we did in this uh, next few slides is that we look at the protein to protein interaction to see which of those proteins actually have a key role in um, connecting with the rest of the protein. Um, so we identify here um, several nodes that are very uh, dominant uh, among all the 136 transcripts. And, um, the, and then the, those nodes are what we call the central hub genes. Um, and several of the, these candidates are quite interesting. For example, XRN1, uh, which is uh, important for um, this is an enzyme called exoribonuclease and involved in mRNA decay. Uh, G3BB1 is involved in um, innate immunity, where DNMT1 uh, is in, important for methylation, which is uh, quite important for uh, epigenetic control of gene expressions. And um, instead of just looking at a single hub chain, we also do a cluster analysis and identify several clusters here um, that actually have uh, some 
quite interesting candidate like EEF2 or SMYD3. Um, so in this uh, slide, this is the last result slide. Um, so what we look at is the, uh, to see um, the co-expression score of uh, these protein transcript and the intensity of the color in this map indicate the level of confidence that two protein are actually functionally uh, associated. Um, so in conclusion, we have identified um, several candidates um, of relevance to asthma disease uh, that are also uh, in agreement with previous study. So these candidates can be used as potential target for further investigation into diagnostic application. Um, the focal adhesions in the top function of the yellow co-expression model could play a role in um, amyloid beta signaling and cell death. And two other candidate genes highly correlated with MMSE value um, are involved in actin binding processes and have and this process has previous been previously shown to involve in asthma disease but all physiology as well. So uh, for our next study, we would like to expand the sample, uh, obviously, and look in more detail about the biological processing and pathway related to asthma disease battles physiology, and then validate um, the candidate that we found in this prelim cohort on a larger uh, population. So thank you everyone for listening. Sorry, I'm kind of losing my voice at the end. So hopefully that does not really interrupt with your comprehension. And I'm happy to take any question that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Huang, uh, for this great talk. I just want to uh, remind all the attendees that you can ask, uh, put in your questions in the QA section, and we we'll answer some of them at the end after the second speaker. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Michael Lorenzo. And just briefly, Dr. Lorenzo is an associate professor of neuroscience at the Institute of Medical Biochemistry from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. He received many awards and distinction for his work on the mechanisms of cognitive dysfunction in dementia. I just want to highlight two Ebro Travel Awards in 2014 and 17, the Ebro Connecting Region Award in 2020, and the Ebro Early Career Award in 2021. So today, Dr. Lorenzo will talk about metabolic uh, factors associated with cognitive impairments in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuela, for the nice introduction, and thank everyone for being here, and of course, the Ebro uh, Early Career Committee uh, for inviting me to be here to talk about some of uh, the things that we're doing in our laboratory. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions at the end of, of this talk. So uh, I'm trying to, I'll try to tell you a, a bit of what we've been doing in our laboratory over the past few years. That's more of an overview of what we're doing but it relates to metabolic and inflammatory mechanisms relating uh, memory failure in Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, of course, I can skip a, a large introduction because Dr. Wong had a nice introduction and presented a nice work relating to potential biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease, but uh, I, I want to bring here your attention to the challenges that we have in diagnosis and therapy of Alzheimer's disease, mostly because we don't quite fully understand what happens in the brain when the disease is taking place. So if I had only uh, this slide to tell you what we believe it happens in Alzheimer's disease, I would show you that uh, first there's this better amyloid accumulation in the brain that is followed by tau-mediated neuronal injury. And both a beta and tau together, they likely cause alterations in brain structure, in memory, and ultimately in clinical function as disease progresses. So we studied uh, for a couple of years uh, the consequences of A-beta in the brain. So we know that A-beta forms these plaques, these amyloid plaques that alloy Alzheimer described more than 100 years ago. But we now know that the amyloid beta peptide also forms oligomers, uh, which are soluble and diffusible versions, isoforms of the beta amyloid peptide. And they are likely bound to synapses. So they have a preference for synaptic targeting, and they cause oxidative stress, 
tau phase relation itself and synapse failure and loss. So that's the main paradigm that we use in the laboratory to study Alzheimer's disease. But what causes Alzheimer's disease? So that's a tough question. Uh, many people think it's genetics. Of course, we have some causal genes, mutations in the amyloid precursor protein and uh, in, in the enzymes that cleave the amyloid precursor proteins, and they are rare. Uh, but when these mutations are present, they cause Alzheimer's disease. But we have an, another number of genes that are associated with an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, FAM2, APOE4, and many others. And all of them have in common the fact that they relate somehow to uh, defective metabolism and or our abnormal aberrant inflammation in the brain. And of course, we have some lifestyle factors that contribute to our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And I want to bring your attention here to uh, inflammation and metabolic disorders. So if you have insulin resistance, if you're obese, if you have diabetes, you're at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So that tells us that there is this metabolic connection and there's this inflammatory connection to Alzheimer's disease that we need to study. Well, uh, several years ago, more than 10 years ago, uh, we described the pathway that happens in the brain that leads, that connects a beta oligomers to memory loss. So what we show here is a, a culture of neurons exposed to these amyloid beta oligomers. They are at increased stress, uh, not the psychological stress, but a cellular stress. So they respond badly to the presence of amyloid beta oligomers. But when we treat these cells with infliximab, which is a drug is to block t, uh, a cytokine called TNF-alpha, this stress is over. This stress no longer happens. So uh, if we block the receptor for the TNF-alpha, which is a cytokine, we also see preserved memory, despite the presence of amyloid beta oligomers. So uh, in short, we, we described a pathway in which A beta oligomers cause increasing the TNF-alpha cytokine levels. Uh, it activates its receptor, TNF-R1. It causes cell stress, mostly through PKR. Uh, and this has twofold implications. The first one is a kind of uh, defective insulin signaling in the brain. And on the other hand, it causes impaired protein synthesis in the brain. Uh, this was published 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. And this was the cover of metabolism at that time. And it was important because it was an inflammatory connection between amyloid beta oligomers and memory impairment in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And in the same paper, we show that if we treat cells or mice with anti-diabetic agents that were new at that time, containing poor neuroglutide, we see protected memory in uh, mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. So that opened the possibility that anti-diabetic agents, of course, in line with several evidence from my previous supervisor, from many other labs, but it altogether showed that maybe uh, treating diabetes or treating uh, or harnessing the potential of anti-diabetic compounds could be promising for Alzheimer's disease. I know that this is in clinical trials now. We have novel anti-diabetic agents uh, available now, semaglutide, terzerpatide, and others. Uh, and this is a very promising uh, approach, in my opinion. But of course, it has to be tested in, in humans and efficacy should be shown before we move forward. But we also got interested in understanding the effects of non-pharmacological approaches in Alzheimer's disease. So we turned out to investigate exercise because exercise is a cheap, uh, largely available uh, approach that could be useful for many diseases. So it has benefits in the brain. Everybody knows that exercise is good for the body uh, and for the brain too. But of course, we need to understand better what happens in the context of Alzheimer's disease. So there are clinical evidence, there is clinical evidence showing that if you're able to regularly exercise, you're at reduced risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And patients who are already diagnosed with MCI, myocognitive impairment, or Alzheimer's disease, moderate, mild and moderate Alzheimer's disease, they benefit from exercising. So of course, it's not the cure, but there's some uh, potential there that we could harness to uh, <clears throat> perhaps develop novel approaches for Alzheimer's disease. 
But before that, we need to fully understand the neuroprotective mechanisms induced by Alzheimer's disease. And we focused on a, a myokine a hormone called irisine. Some of you may have heard about it before, uh, but for those of you who have never heard about it, uh, irisine was described 12 years ago as a hormone derived from a precursor protein called FNDC5. Uh, and it's uh, an exercise induced myokine. That means it's produced by the muscle and it's increased, it increases in levels after exercising. And this myokine, this hormone, was shown to increase in human plasma after exercise. And when we give it to obese mice, they have less glucose intolerance. And we decided to investigate uh, what happens in terms of virus in, in Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing in collaboration with Joe Sambra uh, at that time in Kentucky, uh, we showed that uh, post-mortem human brains from Alzheimer's disease, especially notably from late Alzheimer's disease, had reduced the levels of iris in, in the brain. And in collaboration with the Dor Institute here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we observed that the cerebrospinal fluid of patients who were diagnosed with a kind of dementia, either Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia, they had reduced levels of iris in, in their CSF. So that tells us that the central nervous system has uh, produces irisin and has less levels of irisin in cases of dementia. And interestingly, the CSF irisin correlates well with a memory score, here's the minimental score exam, uh, minimental state exam, and it correlates well with the levels of beta amyloid in the CSF. So that tells us that there's some correlation with memory and with pathology in Alzheimer's disease. And to make a long story, a uh, very long story short, uh, when we give iris in to the brains of Alzheimer's disease models, we see a consistent neuroprotection, robust neuroprotection. So if we overexpress uh, I, uh, the precursor protein with the viral vector here, uh, we got a 80% uh, overexpression level and we see protection in memory tests. So mice that receive better amyloid, they cannot differentiate, discriminate to the two objects, an old and a novel one. Uh, but if they receive irisin, they can discriminate. That's a memory paradigm that we use in the laboratory. And we got the similar results in three different mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. And if we exercise those mice, but they have blocked irisin. If you block irisin with an antibody, we don't see a beneficial effect of exercise in the brain. So again, that tells us that irisin is neuroprotective in Alzheimer's disease, and it, it at least in part mediates the beneficial effects of physical exercise in the brain. Uh, these results were published a couple of years ago. Uh, it received lots of attraction uh, in the field. Uh, and we are now investigating what, what is irisin doing in the brain to cause neuroprotection. One thing that we observed is that it blocks oxidative stress. So uh, A beta oligomers cause oxidative stress, but in the presence of irisin, it no longer happens. And more recently, last year, we published a paper showing that a single, nu single nucleotide polymorphism and the gene that produces irisin, FNC5, uh, is associated with hypometabolism, less glucose metabolism in the brains of humans, of elderly humans. So that's important because it connects irisin to metabolism in the brain. Uh, of course, irisin is not the only exercise molecule. There are lots of molecules that are, uh, are responsive to exercise and that mediate important effects in the brain. And that's the field that we continue to study and we want to better understand this landscape in the brain. But this is important because exercise and changing lifestyle for a better, uh, more healthy lifestyle is an important factor of prevention in autoimmune disease. So either in people with low genetic risk or high genetic risk, exercise is protective in conjunction with other lifestyle changes, including uh, 
be uh, better nutrition, uh, cognitive training, and others. Okay, for the last part of my talk here, I want to go back to the inflammation side of the story. But before I was talking about um, cytokines and proteins that mediate uh, the inflammatory response in Alzheimer's disease. But now I want to turn into lipids. Uh, and in particular, we've been studying uh, lipoxin A4, which is a lipid-derived mediator of inflammation that actually tries to resolve inflammation, to stop inflammation. And it's very well known in the literature, but we, we knew little about it in the brain. And uh, 10 years ago, a collaborator published that lipoxin A4 is an agonist for the cannabinoid receptor CB1 in the brain. And we investigated uh, if lipoxin A4 had any connection to Alzheimer's disease. And we measured the levels of lipoxin A4 uh, in the CSF of Alzheimer's disease patients. Again, we saw a reduction in the levels of lipoxin A4 in the CSF of AD patients, but also in the, in the CSF of uh, Lewy body dementia. The levels of lipoxin A4 in the CSF associate with a memory score called mini mental state exam score. It also correlates with a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and with the levels of a beta 4 2 in the CSF of humans. So that tells us that lipoxin A4 may somehow associate with memory in humans. And when we give lipoxin A4 to the brains of mice that received uh, an pro-inflammatory stimulus, which is LPS here, like a polysaccharide, uh, we observe that lipoxin A4 protects against memory impairment, as we can see here, and it also protects against increased inflammation in the brains of these mice. So LPS mice have increased levels of IL-1 beta, but this does not happen to most of mice who received LX A4, lipoxin A4 2. So these results were published uh, in 2022, but we continue to uh, investigate the potential role of lipid modifiers of inflammation in the brain in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, as conclusions, uh, I want uh, to I want you to have the take home message that inflammation, especially neuroinflammation, is an important trigger of memory loss in Alzheimer's disease. But we can block that. We can block that with changing lifestyle uh, that could be potentially mediated by Irisin, which is an hormone, hormone that we studied uh, as a beneficial <clears throat> mediator of exercise. And of course, we can change that with um, uh, other habits such as diet and cognitive training. So we need to understand better the roles of regulators of metabolism and inflammation in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we as neuroscientists generally think about the brain controlling the, the rest of the body, everything in our lives. But of course, we need to think of how uh, peripheral mediators of inflammation of metabolism send messages to the brain to cause uh, alterations in our brain function. I want to thank collaborators, many collaborators and funding agencies that made this work possible and leave here my contact. So I'm happy to discuss with Dr. Wong and everyone who might have any questions here. Thank you very much again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Michael, for this beautiful presentation. And I think that we can move on to the Q&A section. So you're all invited to submit your questions and please address the, the speaker. Uh, I want to, I will start with a question for Dr. Huang. Um, yes. yes. Dr. Juan, can you please provide a comment about the modifiable risk factors associated with Alzheimer's disease and their influence on the genes you have investigated? This is a question for Gautam Kumar Babu. Um, thank you for your question. So I think uh, perhaps you are try, uh, referring the, to the environmental risk factor uh, that uh, could... Um, lead to changing uh, the probability of someone getting Alzheimer's disease. For example, if uh, a diet is one of the factor that actually influence Alzheimer's disease risk, another factor is um, is uh, the, um, the education level uh, of uh, 
the patient. So I think this risk factor perhaps can um, interact uh, and uh, lead to a bit genetic change and uh, in the end lead to change in genes expression level. Uh, but we haven't really looked it, uh, did any in-depth analysis in terms of which risk factor related to which uh, uh, the differentially expressed gene that we found in our cohort. So I, I cannot really comment on uh, that aspect. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the next question. So um, this question is directed to uh, Dr. Lorenzo. Um, so uh, the question is around, um, did you see any specific of sex as a risk factor for the um, pathogenic pathway you have studied. And I think um, there's somewhat similar question for um, Dr. Hati as well. So I guess um, we'll get um, uh, Dr. Lorenz so to give his comment about sex effects and then um, uh, Dr. Hati can um, uh, comment furthermore about um, sex effects as well. All right. Well, that, that's a very nice question because uh, Alzheimer's disease is more frequent in women. So two thirds of the cases of Alzheimer's disease happen in women. I haven't myself studied uh, the roles of sex different, but that's a training topic now. I know there are several groups who are working on that. Uh, but we know that there are differences in terms of inflammatory responses in men and women too. So that's possibly related to uh, why uh, women develop more Alzheimer's disease than men, but uh, I have I don't have an answer as to these specific pathways related to irisin or uh, TNF alpha. As far as I remember, there was no clear difference in terms of irisin levels in men and women. Uh, so they were all, okay. Men and women had reduced levels of irisin in Alzheimer's disease, but that that's a relevant question, and I guess that. But we'll know more about it in the future years, in the coming years. Uh, so I believe I'm going next. Um, so I think the question is about the role of gender in the up and down relation of the certain genes expression. Um, so we, uh, to be honest, we haven't looked into uh, that analysis yet. Um, ideally, with this a very small side cohort, we would like to have the genders between the two groups as balanced as possible. Um, but we, uh, within the time frame uh, that we have, we couldn't really do that. Uh, so we try to not having the, the gender in any group like too uh, extreme, uh, the ratio enough to extreme into one gender versus the other. Um, but I believe that there are definitely some gender influence on gene expression. Um, I think the cohort is too small to do that kind of analysis. But if we can expand the sample size in our next study, then we definitely will look into that aspect. Thank you. Uh, the next question is addressed to Michael. So uh, do you look in the mouse models any role for the gut brain axis uh, in relation to inflammation and irisin? That's another good question. Uh, this is another training topic, the, the gut connections to the brain. Um, we haven't studied that in particular, but I know there are some groups doing that. And uh, especially regarding short-chain fatty acids and how they may modify brain function. So that's a training topic. And of course, they may modify inflammation too. I don't know if there's a connection with irisin. It's something, that's a good question that we could study in the future, but of course there is some connection to inflammation and I believe that some papers will come, uh, come out soon on that topic. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so we've got um, a question directed to um, Dr. Hati Tan Huang. Um, so this is related uh, probably more technical question rather than a, a specific question to uh, the Alzheimer's disease. Um, so um, the question is, uh, is it difficult to extract RNA from plasma for sequencing? And um, what are some uh, technical obstacles um, you've faced? Uh, 
my short answer is yes, it is quite difficult to extract RNA. Um, I mean, in general, extracting RNA is difficult because RNA is very easy to degrade. There is RNA's enzyme everywhere on your fingertip in the air that can completely destroy them. Um, so we try several uh, protocol for extraction uh, and we have a small conference paper on this, which I'm happy to share uh, later. Um, we're comparing trizone method, uh, which is a um, very standardized method for RNA extraction from other type family. And we also use a kit, uh, um, some other type of kit. And we found that the commercialized kit that is targeting uh, plasma cell free actually work much better. But overall, there's still uh, degrading issues of the RNA when we uh, uh, measure the uh, RNA integrity value. Um, so for the result that I just showed you, we actually outsource a company to do the extraction process and also the sequencing. Thank you very much. I believe we still have time, right? So um, I want to ask um, Dr. Lorenzo uh, if there is any reported role for iris in microglial cells and astrocytes in other types of cells in the brain. Uh, I don't know if you have... Um, if you did some work on that or to have some evidence to share? Well, uh, there's a group in Harvard that uh, gave the pre preliminary evidence that iris may act in astrocytes. So their receptor might be in astrocytes and they may modify astrocyte reactivity. But of course, more work on that is necessary to clarify the role of iris in astrocytes. Microglia, we're doing something similar to that, but I still don't have an answer to tell you. Yeah, but there's an issue of evidence on the role of iris in, in astrocytes. Thank you. Okay. Um, yep, I've got a question directed to um, Dr. Huang. Um, so is the um, CFRNA different from the uh, novel circular RNA? So, um, or perhaps you might want to um, comment a bit about um, your, um, the, the RNA um, uh, um, differences that you've been um, uh, investigating so far. Uh, so the, the plasma contain the vesicle that um, can come from different type of tissues. They can be secreted from the brain, from the liver, and, and all, all different other type of tissue. And these in these vesicles, we have cell-free DNA, we have cell-free RNA. And among the cell-free RNA sample, um, the type that we investigate is mRNA. And there are also circular uh, RNA and some other type as well. So this is a very specific type of cell-free RNA that we're looking at. Okay, do we have any more questions? I think that maybe we can ask uh, the, the, two, the two speakers to give a general comment about the field. How are the perspectives in terms of um, identification, uh, risk and treatment of the patients? And what are the perspectives in your work? Maybe we can start with uh, Michael. Sure. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time to work in Alzheimer's disease right now because uh, we're evolving a lot in terms of diagnostic approaches. Now we have these plasma assays that have been uh, evolving quite rapidly and they show a, a good promise of working in terms of clinical settings. And we are, of course, advancing in terms of treatment because we have now these new antibodies against beta amyloid uh, lecanemab and dononimab, uh, who are showing that uh, these are the first antibodies that effectively show some disease modification effect, in my opinion. And of course, it's not the cure. We don't have a cure yet, but we know that we can change the disease, some uh, modify the disease course. And that's really important for us. Uh, it shows that we are in the right track, in the right direction. So in terms of my work, uh, I want to understand a molecular basis of these lifestyle interve interventions in Alzheimer's disease so we can perhaps develop more effective approaches. And of course, we want to understand the molecular pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease so we can perhaps help develop uh, better biomarkers. So that's the perspective of my, of my work. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. 
Um, can you uh, help me uh, repeat the last part of the question? I couldn't really hear. Uh, just wonder about your perspective about the field where where is moving on and about your work, about your perspective and plans. Um, so I agree with um, everything that my already said about how the field is evolving very rapidly. Uh, from the diagnostic and from animal model uh, um, direction. And there's like also a lot of um, new technique that allows you to actually dissect the disease at different level, from circuit level to molecular to cellular level. For our work, um, um, as I also briefly mentioned in the conclusion, we, we want to uh, continue um, using this cell free RNA analysis as a way to look into the um, Disease progressions and also uh, understand about like a lot of um, how these change at the plasma level actually correlate with clinical measurement. Uh, we are more in a practical and application end of this research spectrum, and uh, that also um, partially due to funding <laughs> issues because that's what our government uh, and the funding source we have is more uh, focusing on. Okay, thank you very much. I think that that's it. So I just want to thank again uh, Dr. Lorenzo and Dr. Juan uh, for sharing your data and your insights on the field. I also would like to thank the Ibro Early Career Committee for the organization, especially Jack and Lynn. Uh, I want to thank the amazing technical support from Carolina and Angelique. And I also, I would like to remind you all that this uh, webinar um, is also um, promoting the, a mini series to be published in Ibro Neuroscience Reports, featuring two volumes, Molecular and Cellular Neurosciencing, System and Computational Neurosciencing. And we are um, uh, trying to get as many as submissions from early career neuroscientists so feel free to check the, the, the mini series and submit your work. And I also would like to share with you that the Ibro ECC is organizing two events at FANS this year. So for those of you who, who are attending, uh, check uh, how to deal with imposter syndrome uh, and bridging borders and building bridges. Uh, it's going to be two exciting events to discuss important uh, questions uh, for early career researchers and researchers in general. So thank you very much. And that's it. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening.